Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. It's good to see y'all. Good to see everybody in the room. Um, hey, yeah, let's just go straight forward. Would you stand? Would you stand with us here? Want to open us up with a word of prayer? Y'all, I know a lot of y'all just really like these days where we can go acoustic, where we can just focus in a little bit easier on maybe the context of the songs, the words, the meanings, the spirit in them. So yeah, I've been just really looking forward to this morning here. Let's pray it up. Lord God, thank you. Father God, thank you. Lord, that we just get to be in your house. Father God, that we get to be with fellow believers. God, that this can be a, a welcoming place for those that wouldn't call themselves believers yet. Father God, as we come in here, some of us are celebrating, some of us are searching, and Lord God, some of us are just desperately holding on to you right now. And Father, we pray that this would be a welcome house for every single one of those types of people here today. Father God, we know you have shown your faithfulness throughout the ages, and God, I believe that you are doing that even now. Even in every single one of those circumstances, God, whether it's someone coming in with a song of praise on their heart, or that someone coming in with doubts about even the most basic detail of you, God. Whether it's someone coming in and even just getting the feet out of the bed today was a struggle. Father God, so many of us come here today just believing that you are faithful and that you are working in all those. So Lord, I pray that our praise this morning will just go up to you. Lord, that it would bless your heart and that it would be part of the work of this church that is doing something in the hearts and lives of everyone in the room today, no matter how they came in. So Lord, thank you for that. Thank you for your spirit that is at work in the room even now. Father God, help us to praise you rightly today. We we'll love you. We trust you. We praise you. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. Let's go for it, y'all. Cause I know you'll make a way I don't always understand I don't always get to see But I will believe it I will believe it Cause you make mountains move You make giants fall You use songs of praise to shake prison walls and I will speak to my fear and I will preach to my death that you were faithful then that you'll be faithful now I'm standing You will fight my enemies This will end in victory and I will believe it Yes, I will believe it As you make mountains move You make giants fall You use songs of praise To shake prison walls And I will speak Oh, 
shake prison walls I will speak to my fear I will preach to my doubt You were faithful then You'll be faithful now yeah, You make mountains move You make giants fall Hear you songs of praise To shake prison walls I will speak to my fear I will preach to my doubt that you were faithful there. You'll be faithful now. Yeah, you were faithful there. You'll be faithful now. You're here and I 
seated. Yeah, I know we're all on the acoustic vibe this morning, right? We're all kind of swaying. But I'm going to tell you right now. Did you hear the start, stop, clap after the first song? Yeah. Did you hear that? Yeah. Oh, we shouldn't. <laughs> Don't do that. If you're going to let it go, let it go. All right? I mean, I, I know we all around the campfire this morning, but somebody got to let it go a little bit. All right? Hey, it's good to see you this morning. So glad you're here to worship with us. Oh, yeah, I'm chastising you. That was the pastoral love right there, right? No. Uh, so glad that you're here with us this morning. I know we've got uh, some folks out and about this week, and I'm just glad to see you. Glad that you're here to worship with us and look forward to our time of worship continuing and being in the Word together. Uh, if you're a guest with us, thank you for being here, especially to you. We're glad you're here worshiping with us. Um, in front of you in the chair, you'll look to see one of these. These are called our Connect cards. We would love for you to fill one of those out. And as you leave today, and as you shake my hand in the back, or if you go out the sides avoiding me, um, those boxes right there on the sides, drop that in if you would, please. You got, you got that. You Finally, somebody got it, right? Thank you. All right. Put that in there so that we can get in touch with you, and we can just pray for you. I, I tell everybody every week, we're not going to show up randomly at your house, uh, but we do want to just say hello and get to know you. But thank you so much uh, for being here with us today. A um, lot going on uh, this week, especially today. Uh, first and foremost, we will have church conference right after worship service this morning, um, so please be sure and stick around for that. Senior Salt uh, breakfast this week coming up. Today is the deadline to sign up for that, okay? If you haven't done that, please do that today. That breakfast, you see it there. Uh, do today. The uh, breakfast is this Friday, so let's uh, get together uh, with that. Looking forward to that. Annie Armstrong Easter offering. We set a 3,500 goal, and we beat you into submission to giving. <laughs> And um, just want you to know and celebrate that we have given over $5,000 to Annie Armstrong. So great job, church. They see, that's what you're supposed to do, right? Just let it go. Let the joy go crazy. Uh, youth Yard Sale Fundraiser coming up this coming Saturday, May 7th, 6 a.m. to noon. If you want the good stuff, you better be here early. Uh, so looking forward to that as well. We have our golf tournament coming up on May 21st. This week is this month is already crazy. Mother's Day next week, a lot going on. And then also Vacation Bible School coming up June 12th through the 16th. Believe it or not, we, today is May 1st. That means that Vacation Bible School is like six or seven weeks away. All right. Yes. So, yeah, thank you. Again, you're doing a great job. Um, some of you all were not as excited about Vacation Bible School as you need to be. All right. You need to be more excited about that. Okay. Um, we'll work on that for next week. We got some practice time, all right? But man, just so many things going on um, in the life of the church. And this past weekend um, here, we had a great weekend where if you were not with us last weekend, uh, missed out on meeting Jonathan and Ariel. Uh, we voted to call them as our new Connections pastor. They'll be starting uh, the last Sunday of May. And so continue to pray for them and reach out to them. For those of you who did send him Facebook friend requests, after today, you may start talking with him on there, okay? Um, let him talk to his church first today, but um, um, he's not, as I said last week, he's not ignoring you. He's just trying to make through and get through this well. So, but lots going on. Hope and pray that you're connected somehow. Uh, and if you're not, now is the time to get connected. It's just going to take off from here in this time of year. And so uh, I want to just make sure you're aware of all that's going on together. So as we continue to worship this morning, I want to ask you to pray where you are today. Uh, just lay anything out to the Lord that you would have before you. Um, maybe you need to surrender some things to Him. Maybe you need to thank Him for something. Maybe the fact that you're just here this morning in your life is pretty miraculous. Maybe you've got some things going on that you didn't think you were going to be here today, but you are. And you just want to thank God for that. Uh, maybe today there's some, some sickness or some family matters. Maybe you need to lay your children down at this altar. Maybe your marriage maybe your spouse, whatever it is. Um, just feel the freedom today to come to Christ and, and lay that down, knowing that He is fully capable and willing uh, to meet you where you are. Uh, so let me pray for you as you pray today. Father, we love you so much, and we thank you for the opportunity to be with brothers and sisters in Christ today. And God, uh, I know that for some of us here today, um, the fact that coming here to spend time with one another and to spend time with you, it's been an overwhelming thing. Maybe there's things that, you're over, that they're overcoming in life, or maybe they just don't know if this is where they fit, or maybe, God, they're not even sure that they're worthy to be in your presence. And so it's been a struggle. 
But God, what we know about you is that you love us more than anything. And you desire to meet with us right here, right now. So whatever we need to surrender today, whatever we need to lay down, whatever spouse we need to pray for, whatever child is wandering, whatever marriage is struggling, whatever financial situation is, uh, is in desperate need, God, we're not praying for prosperity. We're praying for your presence. We're praying that you would walk us through whatever it is that we face right now, that you would take away any anxiety that we would have, that you would give a spirit of peace so that we can truly focus on who you are in our life and not all the craziness that's going on around us. That as we worship you and we engage your word, that you will teach us and you will grow us and you will help us to become everything that you created us to be. Everything that your son died for in our lives to be who we are and found in you and you alone. God, today I pray for those families that are not with us today. I pray for those that maybe, Father, just holding on and we don't even know it. Be very real to them today. Speak words into their life through a message, through music, through a person that, God, your way is better and that you are here. We'll just meet you. So, God, whatever you would have to do in each and every one of our lives today, Father, may we respond with great obedience, great trust, and great faith, not in who we are, but in who you are and you alone. We love you, we thank you, and praise you. In the precious name of Jesus Christ, we pray. God's people said.
Thank you so much to our worship team folks. I love sometimes how we can switch gears a little bit and just kind of <sighs> take a deep breath, you know, and um, just really sit in, the, in the, the quietness and the stillness of the presence of God and be together. Um, that's a blessing. It's a blessing. And not, we don't always have the opportunities to do that together. Uh, I want to start a series uh, today um, until we finish, and I don't want to rush through this because um, we have been talking about this whole year so far, this, this theme of better together, and I know we've talked about concepts, we've talked about what it looks like, we talked about service and, you know, fellowship, and we've talked about all these biblical um, things that, that really connect the body of Christ together, and it's great to talk about them, right, you know, I mean, it's awesome to know things, but um, I don't know, but some of you guys may be more like tangible learners, you know, it's like, yeah, uh, you can tell me about something, but let me get my hands on it. You know, let me mess around with it. Let me break it, some of you, right? And then figure out what I don't know, <laughs> you know, but that's how we do. And, and so I wanted to take this, this time to, to really go through with you Paul's letter to the church at Philippi, Philippians, because Philippians is a tangible way to understand what better together really is. And, and so this morning I'm going to start going through that with you because I think we need to see not just the concepts, but the reality of the fact that, that we are better together. And it's not something that we just come up with some catchphrase, but that it really works. And not only does it work just because we say it works, because it worked in the Word of God. And Paul's relationship with this church, man, it's phenomenal. He loves them, and they love him, and they are together in the work that God's calling them to be in. And man, God's just doing amazing, amazing things. So I want you to turn with me to the book of Philippians this morning. I want to read, beginning in chapter 1, uh, the first 11 verses with you. And, and I want you to just really pay close attention this morning, not just to what Paul is saying to this church, but how he's saying it and the words that he's using as he greets this church this morning. Philippians chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, with the overseers and the deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 3, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all are making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. And it is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more, with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory and to the praise of God. 
Father, we read Your words from Paul to the church this morning. And we have an absolute example of what it's like when Your people realize the benefit of community. And it's not just from Paul as a leader or just a congregation to a leader, but they are one in the same because they're united in purpose. And I pray today that we will learn that because of Jesus Christ in each and every one of our individual lives, that corporately as the body of Christ in work with the Spirit, that we truly are better when we do this together. We love you and we thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said. I put a quote on the screen for you this morning from Francis Chan from his book, Crazy Love. If you've not read that book, I highly recommend you read that book. It's fantastic. He says this. He says, Our greatest fear as individuals and as a church should not be fear of failure, but of the succeeding at the things in life that do not matter. And I read that, and I've read this a number of times, and, and, and I truly get and feel his heart in this. You know, we live in a culture today, especially even in the church, that, that wants everything to be successful, but nobody has a real good biblical definition of success. What the world says looks good and successful is not necessarily what God says is successful. And one of the things that I think that sometimes happens is we get to striving so hard to be good at something, and then when you find out that something was the wrong thing, then you're in this place of great disappointment and great hurt. And, and so when he says that, that our greatest fear as an individual and as the corporate body of Christ should not be that we're going to fail at something, but we're going to really do something really well that doesn't matter in the end. You have to filter and strain things out even in the body of Christ. Because a lot of our well-intentioned efforts and times and all these things that we go after may not necessarily be what God desires that we're going after. And so when we look at the church at Philippi and what Paul is talking with them about, they are right on the mark of succeeding at what matters. And when you read these first 11 verses, you know what matters? It's the gospel. It's the gospel. Next Sunday, believe it or not, some of you are like, oh gosh, really? Um, next Sunday will mark one year of our ministry together here at Cudden Memorial Baptist Church. That blow, it blows my mind, all right? And I've got to confess to you, I really do, that as always, God's timing is perfect in planning and working through this series together. Because, you know, every week, here's what I do, is I'm trying to prep for sermons. You know, I'm, I'm reading commentaries, and boy, are they fun, let me tell you. I'm perusing articles. I'm cross-referencing scripture. Oh, this was here, and this was said here. Um, trying to figure out exactly what God is saying so that I can say, okay, this is what God's saying, and do it rightly and do it accurately so that we don't waste our time on ridiculous things. That when we're together, we're really focusing on who we are to be in the body of Christ, this community of faith, and what's important, what really matters. But I want you to know something. The last couple of weeks have been very different for me. Um, it's been different because as I read Paul's words to the church here in Philippi, I read about his love for these people. You just heard it. How much he appreciates them. He's concerned for them and and, 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 and thanking them for focusing on the right things. And you know what? I get it. I get it. It's not been about articles and commentaries, because quite honestly, I could write the very same thing about you, church family. These last 12 months so far, man, God is just, your love for people, your love for us, the fact that you're willing to, to, to really go through some tough passages of Scripture, to see you serving around the body of Christ. Man, I get Paul's love for the church at Philippi. Because I'll be honest, folks, I love the ministry that we've got right now that God has given to us. And I love that every one of you are, are at least attempting to be engaged. And over this past year, man, God has reigned his sovereignty over us in some pretty amazing ways, hasn't he? He really, really has. Um, you know, I'm thankful, really, and maybe you are too, that you know, we've seen new families coming to church. 
We've seen familiar faces and families coming back home, right? Um, I'm thankful that the baptistry behind me hasn't been a wall decoration, but the waters are moving, and we've seen children come to know Christ, and we're seeing them, we're prepping for more of those. I'm thankful for this church staff that we just saw grow by one last week. I'm thankful for the choir, I'm thankful for you, I'm thankful for our worship teams, because we're all striving to come to the heart of Christ and to be everything he wants for us to be. And I'm so thankful, and I love what God is doing here. And that's what Paul first says to this church. I love what God is doing in our midst. And I'm thankful for that. But you know, out of this thankfulness that I have, this love that I have, there comes this responsibility. And the responsibility is to keep the ship going in the right direction, right? To not be like Peter, walking on water and get distracted by everything, but keeping our eyes fixed where? On Jesus. Um, how many of y'all would say this morning you have a life verse? Like one that's like, pow, this is my life verse, baby. It's my go-to. Yeah, some of y'all do. And that's fine. like, oh, no, if I raise my hand, is he going to tell me I'm horrible for having one? No, I'm not. But, you know, I have wrestled with a verse now for a couple of years. I'm going to lie to you. And I can't call it my life verse, but I call it my goal verse. Like where I'm trying to get. And, and Paul, uh, Luke writes these words about Paul in Acts chapter 20, 24. I put it on the screen for you this morning. And this is kind of my goal verse where he says, but I do not account my life of any value, value, nor do I keep it precious to myself, if only that I may finish my course and the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus, which is to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Man, I wish it was my life verse. It's my goal verse, but we're there. And that's kind of where I find ourselves when we come to Philippians, is that we try to be reminded of what matters, and what counts. And what Paul tells them in the very get-go is this is what matters and this is what counts. And that is going to be the partnership in the gospel of Christ. And that's where our love comes from. So I have three things that I've been praying over for you as a church family and praying over for myself as we get into this message and this series through Philippians. The first one is this. The first thing I'm praying is this, is that absolutely nothing will matter more to us than the gospel. Absolutely nothing. Second is that our love for God and for one another is going to ignite an urgency and an authenticity in our lives. That we begin to realize because of the love we have for God and the love we have for one another and how we should love others that we don't have as much time as we really think we do. And that we become uh, under a new sense of urgency to share the gospel and to encourage that we live our lives as authentically before others as we can. And then third would be simply be this. That better together is not just a mantra, but it is our mission. That we walk together with the body of Christ. So on your worship folder this morning, I've got a couple things that I want to walk you through. And the first thing that I share on your message notes is this, is that Paul is going to encourage and challenge the Philippian church in a couple ways here this morning, all right? And from the very get-go, uh, Paul starts out and says this, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, Always in every prayer of mine for you, all, for you all, making my prayer with joy. And when you read that, uh, many of y'all have grown up in the church all of your lives. Some of you haven't, some of you have. But let me ask you just a real serious question this morning. How many times can you truly save your life that every time you thought about the church, you were just filled with joy? And some of y'all are lying right now because you woke up this morning and saw you had nursery schedule and you were not filled with joy. Your Facebook notification went off yesterday, and you're like, no, I get it, right? And some of you, it's, some of us have had bad church experiences. So the first thing you think about at church is not joy, but it's probably maybe judgment or maybe isolation. I mean, but, but think about the, the unique thing that, that Paul is saying here. It's like every time I think of you, I'm happy. <laughs> I'm full of joy. I don't think about conflict. I don't think about backstabbing. I don't think about gossip. I don't think about anything else other than joy. Is that not the kind of relationship the body of Christ ought to have? That when we think of one another, the first thing that impacts our heart is joy? Man, how awesome is that? He goes on to talk about the connection that he has with them. And that connection comes in verse 5. That core connection between Paul and the church is partnership of the gospel. It's not a preacher preaching. It's a church living. Everyone is involved in the sharing and the teaching about Christ. 
Here's a quick reminder and a quick kind of go back to you. Remember this word partnership in Philippians right here in Philippians 1.5? Because of your partnership in the gospel, guess what that word partnership is? Quanonia. Y'all remember that from January? Uh-oh, did I die or something? Here? Oh, there we go. Sorry. Awesome. God might be saying, be quiet, be quiet, right? He says that their partnership in the gospel, their fellowship in the gospel is their connection point. And church family, our connection point this morning needs to be the gospel. Nothing more, nothing less. Do you notice what Paul doesn't say in this writing? He does not talk about your age that connects you to other people. He doesn't talk about your season of life. He doesn't talk about your skin color. He doesn't talk about your socioeconomic status, what music you prefer, what style of clothing you wear, just the gospel, right? The message of Jesus Christ. That's what Paul praises in their devotion is to the message and the good news of Jesus Christ, the gospel. That word gospel just simply means, you all know this, good news. It's just good news. Now, in Paul's time, Listen, the gospel was a very diluted phrase, okay? You and I hear this from a Christian standpoint, right? In the Hebrew and the Greek languages, the words used for gospel, all that meant was literally good news, like maybe you won a victory in battle or somebody had an announcement to make. So it might sound odd to say that in their culture, when you threw out the word gospel, it wasn't anything spectacular. It was just somebody had good news about something. But that which was not spectacular in the natural becomes absolutely spectacular and supernatural when it comes to saying that it's the good news of Christ. Changes it. Game up, levels on, right? Because now it's not just a message of good news, it's a message of good news about salvation and deliverance and hope and eternal living, not sinfulness and brokenness and hurt all the time. It takes on a completely different facet. And so the challenge that we have as the body of Christ today is what? we got to purify the fact that this word in our culture today has been completely polluted, and it's diluted so much that a lot of people don't know what the gospel even is or what it even means. And so the challenge we have is to get back to what the word of God says the gospel is, not just preaching it and teaching it, but praise God living it when you call yourself a Christian, right? Because that's where we are in the culture that we live today. So what is the gospel? Maybe many of y'all have read uh, 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 an author named R.C. Sproul. He gives a very simple and a very effective breakdown of what the content of the gospel is. On your notes, write these three questions down. This is the gospel in a nutshell. One is, who is Jesus? What did he do? And what does it mean for us? That's the gospel. Who is Jesus? What did he do? And what does it mean for us? Now, I need you to make a very, some type of notation here under that third question. That when I say notice the question, what does it mean for us? It doesn't say what did it mean. Because one of the things that the body of Christ needs to grasp today is that the gospel was not an event. It is a way that we live. Because here's the thing that's happening. We are teaching, and I'll tell you this in just a second. But we are teaching and raising a generation to think that the gospel happened once and that you have no need for it any longer as long as you know Christ. That's a lie straight from Satan. I want to tell you this morning that if you really have a struggle answering those three questions, who is Jesus, what did he do, and what does it mean for me, I would challenge you to say this morning that you have probably found that spot in your spirituality that is frustrating and backpedaling and that you can't get out of. And it's not because you can't overcome life, it's because we truly haven't embraced the fullness of what the gospel means to each and every one of us. So this is a struggle we're fighting that we don't have to fight. When we come to an understanding, for us as the body of Christ and what the gospel means, that a relationship with Jesus is not about what happens to us when we die, but rather a relationship with Jesus is about how we live, then we will understand the fullness of the gospel. In Paul's time, like today, a lot of people want to add to the gospel. It's always Jesus plus something. In the Bible, they're called Judaizers. The Judaizers are like, Jesus is good, but you also got to have 
this. And as I said just a minute ago, that we're raising this generation of believers to truly think that the gospel is only relevant one time in their life. That time when you hear it and you respond to it. And that could be so far from the truth. Let's see if you listened last week. When Jonathan was preaching his message last week, he shared an illustration given by Alistair Begg about the man on the middle cross. Y'all remember that? Nod your head because he's probably watching. All right? All right? So he, he talks about the illustration. But I want you to hear what Alistair Begg's words were in that message about the man on the middle cross and the gospel. He says this, Without preaching of the cross, and without preaching the cross to ourselves all day and every day, we will very, very quickly revert to a faith plus works. Jesus plus something as the ground of our salvation. So, if you go to the old church question, if you were to die tonight and you were getting entry into heaven, what would you say? Listen to this. If you answer that in the first person, you have immediately gone wrong. He says, if you answer, well, because I said this, because I believed that, because I prayed this prayer, because I'm growing. He said, the only proper answer is not I am, it's because he did this for me. That's the gospel. As much as the gospel will save you, please hear me, it is not about you. And it is not about me. It is for me, but it is not about me. It's his story, not mine. He goes on to say, if I don't preach the gospel to myself all day, every day, I will find myself beginning to trust myself, trust my experience, which is part of my fallenness. If I take my eyes off the cross and I give lip service to it only, and if I act like my salvation depends on me, as soon as I go there, it will either lead me to despair or a horrible kind of arrogance. And now we all need to get saved, right? Golly. If the gospel is essential then to our being, don't you think we ought to be accurate in the understanding of it and what it really means? Paul goes on to say there, he says that because of the gospel, that God has started a good work. He who began a good work in you, what does Paul say? He will do what? Finish it in his time. There's not a work that God has started in all of Scripture that he did not finish, including the work he's doing in the life of this church and this people. Paul really gets excited about them. He said because they're not just fair-weather Christians, right? He said, you're with me in the, from the first day. He said, and when I was in prison, you were there. And when I was affirming and confirming the gospel, you were there. And he's telling them, he said, I'm thankful that you're not just fair weather followers of Jesus. He said, you know, in essence, hey, when we're good, God's good. Woo! It's easy to get excited when your life's good, isn't it? Because when your life's good, guess who else is good? God's good, right? But then they flip the coin and say, well, life's tough. Well, God's unfair. That's not who was in the church at Philippi. And it doesn't need to be who's in the church here or any other body that gets together to worship God. They were dedicated to the joy and the suffering. I'm going to tell you what, if you don't know both, you don't truly know all of Jesus. Because over in chapter 3, we'll get there in a few weeks, Paul says this, he says, I want to know Christ. Yeah, I don't want to know part of him. I want to know him. He wants to know not only the power of the resurrection, but also the fellowship of the suffering. Because here's what I believe. I don't think you can appreciate the cross without appreciating your sin. And you can't appreciate the deliverance until you understand the brokenness. All that comes into play. But really today, folks, let's be honest, we're a people with a poor, almost non-existent theology of suffering. And our commitment to the gospel has got to change. It's more than we make it out to be. So he first praises them and encourages them, but then secondly on your worship notes this morning is that he challenges them to grow intentionally. Intentionally. In verses 9 through 11, there's this kind of threefold challenge that Paul gives to the church. It's pretty amazing. The first thing he does is he challenges them to grow and continue to grow in what? You tell me. 
that your what may abound more and more. Your love, your love. The root of a continued to commitment to the gospel in your life and my life is the love of God and the love of others. Does that sound familiar? It should. It's a paraphrase of the greatest commandment, right? What is the greatest commandment? Here's the PK version for you this morning. You love God with every ounce of your being and you love others. And Jesus says that everything rests on those two things. Your love for God and your love for others. So the logic isn't really hard to follow, right? The more we grow in love, that will dictate the urgency with which we need to share the gospel. Because you can't look at someone with love and, and allow them to not hear the gospel. You can't say to them, I love you and never share Jesus with them. Why is that? Because if someone doesn't share Jesus with them, what's going to happen when they die? They will die rejecting him forever. And if you can look at someone in the face and tell them you love them without sharing the gospel with them, you don't love them at all. You don't love them at all. It's a gut check moment, isn't it? Because the greatest thing we can do for someone that we love is to tell them about Jesus. I didn't say save them. You can't save them. I can't save them. But we can tell them about Christ. Paul challenges them also not just to grow in love, but to grow in knowledge and discernment. And Paul challenges them in a very intentional way here, right? And here's the thing. To grow in your knowledge and your discernment, it's not just a personal growth thing. There's a purpose behind our growth. Why is that? Well, Paul tells them right here. Why does he want them to grow? It's verse 10 where he says, so that you can approve what is what? Look at your Bible. Yes, pure and blameless, right? What else? It's excellent, superior. How many of y'all grew up watching Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure? I remember that? Every time I hear the word excellent, I hear them. If you don't know what that is, Google it and you'll never be the same. Your life will change forever. You're excellent, right? Some translations use the word superior. Maybe your Bible uses that word. I've often said from this pulpit to each and every one of you many times that one of the greatest faith challenges that we have before us is letting go of something good to embrace something what? Great. That far too often we settle for less than God's best. And oh wow, PK, that's a great thought. Well, it was Paul. I didn't think that up. I'm not that smart. What did he say here? To grow in your love and the knowledge and the discernment, to figure out what is best. Not what is good, not what is satisfactory, but that which is supernatural. I want you to think for me for just a moment this morning. Why are we so comfortable? settling for less than God's best in our spiritual lives, which have eternal implications, yet we are so driven to pursue and attain the best in our temporary life. It's human nature to pursue the best of the best, isn't it? All right? What do we like to do as a culture? We like cars with the most options, right? Houses with the most space, clothes with the right labels, Churches with the biggest buildings, bigger budgets, that's what we go for. Maybe you don't. The majority of our culture does. All right? And I'm not knocking on any of the millennials or anybody younger than that in there, but throw one of these guys in a car with no Bluetooth and watch them freak out. <laughs> a few years back, I bought a 2003 Mitsubishi Eclipse convertible. It was my pre-midlife crisis stage. And I got in, and my phone rang, and I didn't know what to do because it didn't have Bluetooth. So what did I do? I went home, got on crutch field, ordered a stereo because it had to have Bluetooth, right? I mean, Lord forbid you can't drive a car without being able to talk on the phone at the same time. I mean, they only did it for, what, 900 years, it seems like, right? We don't know. We just, it's the natural thing. If we're going to invest money and then we're going to put ourselves to it, I want the best I can get. And, you know, and I'm, I'm going to work hard. I'm going to pay for this. And I'm going to do this. So I want, I want to sit down on my leather seats and I want them to heat and cool and air and make my coffee and do everything else for me. You know, I want my house. I mean, we do this. This is our culture that we live in. We will give everything we have and get the best of the best for things that will die and rot and rust. But we will often trade the best of the best mentality in our personal lives for a just enough in our spiritual lives. Where, let's be real honest, our 
spiritual lives often look more like a guilt offering than victorious living. I just need just enough of Jesus to keep me in heaven. I need just enough faith for this one thing. I need to do just enough to make sure I feel like he still loves me. And we will trade that bulldog passion mentality for worldly things and we will let it die for the things of God and not think twice about it. We'll pursue everything that rots with a greater passion than what we will. It can last forever. Don't get me wrong, not everything's bad, right? But I'll be honest with you, today, I've probably been guilty of this, maybe you have been too. Just let it sink for a second in your life. Sometimes our, quote, Christian living of the day, it kind of seems to take on more of a posture of entitlement from God than an indebtedness to him. I'm a child of God. I deserve his grace. He's not going to let me fall. I belong to him. As long as I belong to him, I'm good. Yes and no, right? It's like we expect things because of who we are, not who Christ is. And the line is, is, is thin, and it's dangerous, and it's razor sharp to where you either live because you think you deserve something from God, or you live because he deserves everything. It's a fine, fine line. But I'm going to give you a heads up. Pun intended. There's good news. Good news. Our pursuit. What does he say? You need so that you have to be discerning and have knowledge so that you can discern what is best. What is excellent. And if you do that and you're growing in that and you approve that, then you're pure and you're blameless in that day of Christ. That there's righteousness coming through the life that Christ is in you. Why is that? Because we are pursuing the excellent. And when we pursue the excellent, we are pursuing God's glory. And if we, listen, if we are pursuing God's glory, wholeheartedly, all the way in and all in, nothing about ourselves, then our motive is pure and our goal is righteousness and we'll hit it every time. Because it's about Him and not us. Now, any time, this is hard, guys, any time, that we insert how we benefit over God getting the glory, we've tainted his purpose. Because, you know, here's the thing. Well, God gets the glory for this, but I get this too. Bad idea. You know, look, don't go change poopy diapers because you think God's going to wake up. Well, bless your heart. And so, no, we serve because God gets the glory in the dirty diaper just like he gets it in the clean one, right? I mean, we change them all, okay, nursery people. I don't feel like I should be praying for the nursery this morning. I've used you guys a lot. I don't know what that means, but, um, but there's good news, right? So anytime we put our benefit over God's glory, we taint the purpose. And you're going to say, well, hold on a second. What about me pursuing spiritual growth? I mean, I want to grow. I mean, am I putting that over God's glory? Now, hear me, hear me clearly this morning, right? Growing and maturing in our faith, like through prayer, worship, Bible study, service, stewardship, all those things, hey, those are noble. And they are needed. Believe me more than anything. We need that growth. We need that maturity so that we can grow closer in our relationship with God. But here's very clearly this morning what Paul is saying here. As noble as those things are, they are still secondary to the sharing, the teaching, and the preaching of the gospel in the life of a believer. Like, I'm proud of you if you're growing in your worship. Hallelujah, right? But don't spend so much time growing in your worship that you're not telling anybody about who you're worshiping. Or grow in that prayer life. But don't tell, but be sure you're telling people who it is that you're praying to. When you open your Bible, I'm glad you can quote scripture, but tell me about the one who wrote it, right? I'm not knocking you for growing. I want you to grow, but I want you to grow for his glory and not just your benefit. Because the life of a believer and follower of Jesus Christ, it is in you, but it is not about you. And it is not about me, right? So pursue those with the understanding that God gets the glory. I want to close with these this morning. Um, our men's Bible study on Wednesday night, man, I am so thankful for those guys. If you're not in there, I want you to start coming. Man, God is just teaching us through conversation, through reading. It's amazing. I shared with them on Wednesday night. 
that over the last few weeks, I've been spending a lot of time reading and listening and watching anything I can, any kind of information I can, that has come out over these past few years about prominent pastors and churches and ministries that have fallen because of some moral or spiritual failure um, on the part of the leadership. I mean, a few years ago, man, it was like every week some big national powerhouse name was in some great moral failure. And everybody was like, this is what pastors are. Here you go. There he is. That's what they are. A bunch of cheapskate sinners, hypocrites, all this kind of stuff, all these ministries falling down and going down the drain. Now, I'm not going to sit here this morning and recount all of those. That's not the place of the pulpit on a Sunday morning. But I will say, you are most likely familiar with some of those names that I have been reading about. And I wanted to share two things with you this morning pertinent to what we're talking about this morning. There were two of those situations in where pastors were quoted in sermons and or at a conference by saying the following. Speaking about the success, quote, of their church, one pastor said, one day they're going to write books about us. <laughs> to be fair, well, they're writing books about them. But they're not writing about how faithful they were to the gospel. What they're writing about is how their church went from over 15,000 members in attendance on multiple locations every weekend, disappeared and closed every door in less than two years. That's what they're writing about. Another pastor, speaking of the prominence of their church's influence in Chicago, said these words. And I'm not going to name the church because I don't, I'm not going to be slandering. I want, to be, I want you to hear what's being said. Another pastor, speaking on the prominence of his church's influence, said this. Why does, insert church name, so why does ABC, that's not his church, I'm just saying it so you hear it. Why does ABC Church need to succeed? Why do we need to succeed? Here we go. His answer. Because ABC Church is the hope of the world. Let me reassure you today, church family. I love you, but Cud Memorial Baptist Church is not the hope of the world. Jesus Christ is. We cannot and we will not neglect the gospel so that people will write books about our story. Because two things are true. It is his story, and he's already written that book. The gospel, the message, the meaning, the motive, the mission, hear me clearly. It must be our everything or it will be our nothing. I want to ask you something this morning. Do you know the gospel? Not that you're saved. Don't, here's something. Don't just share with me your testimony. And I love your testimony. Man, we love testimony time on Sunday night because it's good. I want to tell you something. That, that's the gospel is his story. Your testimony is your, his story through your story. All right? So I love your testimony. Do we know the gospel? Do we know who Jesus was? Do we know what he did? And do you know what it means for you? Do I know what it means for me? Because once I do, my life will never be lived the same. But what about yours? Paul had joy in relationship with the body of Christ. Not because they baked good stuff and not because they patted him on the back, but because they went after the gospel together. And that's where we have to begin. Let's pray. Father, we love you so much. And your word is powerful. The gospel is life-changing, it's transformative. And it's not just about the time we got saved, and it's not just about what you've delivered us from, but it is your story in our lives that we should be sharing with others around us. And it's not as difficult as we think it is, but it's also not as watered down and polluted as our world makes it to be. It's about Jesus Christ. 
who from the very beginning of time sat as the Son in heaven and along with the Father and with the Spirit set everything into motion, creating all that there is. And then because of our fallenness, taking on flesh and becoming man to do for mankind what we could not do on our own. The one and only perfect Son of God, sinless and blameless, would come and take the weight of the world and sin upon his shoulders. And he would be crucified and die a criminal's death. And be raised to life three days later. And now sits with you at your right hand, waiting on the time for you to say, go get my children. And what it means for us today is that we don't have to live under the oppression of that which we have been forgiven for. That we can start living victorious lives, free from the oppression of that sin, free from the weight of that sin, not forgetting it, but not living in it. God, most people in this world today, they don't care what kind of story that you can tell. They just believe in the story that we live. Are we living the gospel in our lives. So today, God, may we all have a real come to Jesus moment that we may truly look to our lives and see who it is that's getting the glory of the life that we are living. Our lives reflect what we love most. Is that you? God, speak to us today. I'm here to pray with anyone and everyone. May your will be done. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. You stand with us this morning and continue to worship as Chris leads. I'm here to pray with you. You come.